This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Curbivore Coffee Break webinar, Delivering Profits, New Channels for Growing Revenue and Connecting to Consumers. Going to wait a couple uh, moments as the room sort of fills with participants, and then I'm going to kick things over to uh, the wonderful uh, Julie Littman from Restaurant Dive, who will be our moderator for today. And uh, yeah, let's just uh, hold one second uh, while the room fills up. I'm uh, Jonah from Curbivore. Uh, Julie, why don't you uh, take it away while the room uh, fills up the couple more people that we can uh, start introductions. Sounds good. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Julie Letman, senior reporter um, from Restaurant Dive. Um, and we have here today um, Don DeLucci, who's been one of New York City's most popular chefs for the past two decades, leading restaurants like Bedford & Co., Ainsley, Empire Diner, The Lion, and The Waverly Inn. His newest restaurant, Merchant Social, opened in Hudson, New York last year. And um, we also have Matteo Mariotti. Uh, he's founder of Cook Unity, a, the first chef to eater platform marketplace connecting a diverse group of chefs with food lovers to elevate the at-home dining experience. The Cook Unity platform connects eaters to a team of over 70 local, independent, and renowned restaurant chefs that create a changing weekly menu. These fully prepared restaurant quality dishes are delivered to members across the country from Cook Unity's seven state-of-the-art kitchens. And the company currently serves meals to members in almost 90% of the country. And last but not least, we have Perrin Davidson, who is the CEO and founder of Eater Club, a wholesale marketplace. And he is also the publisher of LA Eats. Um, and with that, um, well, we can just get, you know, jump right into questions. Um, to start off with, um, what have all of you been seeing as some of the biggest trends or maybe the big trend that you're kind of following within the restaurant industry? Um, Perrin, why don't we start with you? Well, awesome. Yeah, I think something really interesting that I've been following for a while and I think COVID accelerated was a lot of great chefs and restaurant brands trying to expand beyond their geographic reach with CPG products. I think it's been really interesting to see an extension of brand that can either take them direct to consumer without having to leave their hometown or work with national partners. But it's a great way to build that brand recognition and in a sense a virtual footprint in a way in these markets, which can kind of lead up to many other things, maybe working with community, somebody else, a virtual kitchen, a new concept. But it's a very unique and new way to build your brand nationally without having to have like a capital expenditure to start opening restaurants or partnering. So really excited to see a lot of great brands. I think one of them that comes to mind, that's a larger scale is like Carbone that's done it really well, but there, there's a lot of smaller companies out there too, like one-offs um, on both coasts. But I think that's something that's gonna really continue to grow as well. Yeah, what about you, John? Um, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. As yeah, I, you know, th the pandemic really uh, made a lot of people pivot. <laughs> Let me speak for me. It made me pivot uh, quite heavily. And um, you know, I mean, there was a moment there. I didn't know what what the hell was I was going to do. And um, you know, I had a friend introduce me to Matteo, and you know, if, if I realized that there was an, there was a way, a new way to sort of. Um, to do business, uh, I you know I, even the restaurants that I had weren't really um, you know keen on so the, the, we didn't really really explore the delivery thing you know and and then by the time you know COVID came around and everything was closed I wasn't really well versed in that in the in the whole you know um, the delivery aspect we never really did it in, in a lot of the places that I that I owned so um, when Cook Unity was introduced to me. Um, and I was introduced to Matteo. I was like, well, what, what is this thing? And well, you know, you, you have this kitchen and state of the art and you go there and you do your recipes and we'll, 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 we'll pack it for you and, and distribute it. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, you know, it sort of gave me a, a, a new, a new life. Um, 
you know, to, to from from having no restaurants to now having a new way to actually uh, getting getting uh, we'll make a living making a living number one and then getting getting the food out to whole new and different markets. Um, and Mateo, oh, since Cook Unity, um, you know, is a growing presence in this in this area, um, can you explain kind of how it works? You know, how chefs kind of get can get their their recipes out there, you know, from, you know, ideation to shipping, like what is the whole process that goes into that? Yes, absolutely. And <clears throat> connecting a little bit with the previous topic, um, the, the reasons why we started this platform is very much about the previous question, like what are the trends that we're seeing, what are the changes in, in consumer behavior? We see a bunch of trends um, uh, colliding, one is people are cooking less, so spending less time doing the whole process of grocery shopping, shopping, cooking, cleaning, etc. Second, um, what is called virtual kitchens or cloud kitchens, so delivery overall, people getting more familiar with ordering things online and getting them delivered to their homes. And third, the expectations from consumers that everything should be accessible, like the, the, we call it the democratization of everything, music, um, <clears throat> any type of content. And, and, and now I think it's time for, for food. So the way Cookity works and the way it was of ambition and design is that um, even in the most abundant, like the most abundant culinary cities or areas, like let's say New York City where Cookity was started and where I live and where John lives, we obviously uh, can agree that there's plenty of options there. But even in a place like that, and even a successful chef like John, will only really access people around the restaurant, right? Like maybe a few miles around. For delivery, for sure, the delivery platforms won't deliver from um, Soho to Hudson, right? So John needs to literally open two different restaurants to um, serve those two different uh, pockets of customers. So it's interesting what um, breaking free from the brick and mortar, which is, a different use case. So like we're not like necessarily, uh, we're not an alternative for eating out, we're a completely different um, uh, solution. This is more replacing cooking at home every day and cooking every meal. So it's interesting what breaking free from the brick and mortar allows. And from a kitchen in Brooklyn, now you can serve Hudson and upstate New York, where you can serve Boston, you can serve DC. So uh, the creators like John can access many, many more uh, people with their recipes. And on the customer side, they can access many more chefs in the same platform. So we build infrastructure, we build kitchens that have everything that chefs need to cook their best food. We also provide with the logistics, we provide with the technology. So consumers have an app where they can um, get access and browse all the chefs and all the recipes, but chefs have another app where they can manage their business. So they can see latest trends and latest ratings from customers and how their sales are doing. So the idea is that we will create an ecosystem for um, the talented and passionate creators in the industry. Um, there's people that are extremely good at cooking amazing food. We just want to give them more access and we just want to make easy what surrounds cooking food, the business of doing food. So accounting, logistics, technology, sourcing ingredients, but we don't get involved in the culinary process. Uh, we just want to make it easy of every other distraction for creators that John, what they, what they love to do and what their masters are doing. Great. Uh, and just to remind our participants, we will be uh, doing a Q&A towards the end. So if you do have any questions uh, for our panelists, please be uh, sure to, to submit them on the Q&A box. Um, and then, yeah, moving on. So yeah, in terms of, you know, the chef portion, how do chefs kind of pivot into restaurant to, uh, to recipe development for this larger distribution model so that they can best resonate with a, a large group of customers? I mean, what goes into, you know, looking at your, your, your recipes and thinking more, you know, it, it's going to be shipped or, or you know, we, we have to do more of these in order to get them out? Yeah, good question. I mean, so I, I had a, you know, a pretty, a pretty uh, large uh cache of recipes in my, you know, in my toolbox. So from having, you know, so many restaurants and, and have, <laughs> having done this for so many years. Um, 
So, you know, it's just a matter of figuring out, um, I mean, the stuff, the stuff that we just love to cook and that I love to cook and that sort of represents me. I, I have a, you know, my mother's, you know, my mother's rigatoni, which is, which is, you know, ironically is a bestseller in pretty much every market that I'm in. Um, and it's, it's interesting too, because some, some dishes do very well in some markets and not as well as I'm in, I'm in form in New York, Chicago, LA and Miami. Uh, some dishes do well in, in one market, don't, don't do that well in others, but but the, the 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 Sunday sauce rigatoni does really well in all the markets, so it, it's just an interesting thing. But we sort of you know we test everything, um, you know we test it, and I'm and, and I'm also a customer, so I get the I get the meals at home, and so I just can can check on the quality and check on the how how the, these recipes translate, um, you know, doing travel and stuff. So um, did that answer your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, you know and. Uh, along those lines of, you know, reaching those new markets, I mean, what does it mean, you know, to be a customer in like those smaller markets where you don't get, have access to New York food or, you know, all those, you know, LA food, all the culinary um, spots? I mean, what does it mean from a consumer's perspective to, you know, suddenly you can get all these foods without having to travel somewhere? And you're, I mean, you're joining this part of this community now. What is that? How is that? What does that mean from a consumer perspective? Well, I can tell you that, you know, I, you know, at the Waverly Inn, uh, people would come from you know, miles around, wait months for a reservation there and to come and have the mac and cheese. And I actually had someone um, from, I think it was Virginia, um, email me on my, or text me on my, uh, reach out to me on my website and said, oh my God, you know, I, we, <laughs> we never thought we'd eat this again until we, until we came to New York. And lo and behold, it's, you know, we found this, this platform and you're on it and, you know, so that's, I mean, it's a pretty cool thing. I mean, it was, it was, it was, um, it was quite surprising and, 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 and quite nice to, to, uh, to hear that and have that experience. If I, if I can um, add to that. Yeah. Yes, of course. I was um, going to ask you. Yeah, that, that, that was a big part of inspiration to, to start this business. Like we as consumers, as food, foodies, as people that love food, love to travel and some of our, most memorable, nicer experiences in life are around food and are related to food. Like it's as simple as saying like, I try so many meals that I love along the years that I cannot enjoy again, right? It might be like walking down the streets of a foreign city or like in a, in a restaurant that it was in a city that I, I used to live, but now I move. So like that a reason of getting access again of the dishes and the creators that people love but they don't have geographic access to is a very big reason why we believe this type of model and this type of platform has a place in the next decades and there's a lot of examples like the one john just said we were expecting to have good success in a city like new york city where we started at the beginning because people that live there love to eat out, love food, recognize the chefs, appreciate the craft of cooking. Uh, and that happened, but we were uh, positively surprised by the suburbs and even rural areas where a lot of people don't have access to restaurants, maybe live in the city, now they move out, especially during COVID, a lot of people decided to keep working um, in whatever ambitious job they have, but now they can choose to do that one hour, two hours away from, from cities. And, and it's, it's, it's awesome to, to have those cases um, like John was sharing. And I was gonna say about the, the customer on the other side too, which is now they obviously have a lot more choices. So it's twofold. One, it gives a lot of access to these great places that they never would, which opens up so many new markets. And I think it gets people to, you know, you can't come into the city, you know, once a month maybe, but you could definitely order once a month at least. So it adds this new customer. On the other hand, now customers have so many choices. So how does a restaurant stand out? This is where, you know, a quality chef coming in and actually managing their virtual concept or these kitchens in a more efficient way versus licensing them. Ultimately, you want to have product that's going to be great. So I think the customers are going to have all these great choices, but it's going to be the concepts that really know how to execute that are going to stand out and their people are going to come back to. It's great, obviously, if you've been to a restaurant, you already know you love it. There's going to be a much greater chance that you're going to love this new concept. If you believe in the chef, you know, they're going to put energy into where they're actually setting up. So this is what's going to separate them versus nothing wrong with certain restaurants that are spinning up concepts in the back of their kitchen, 
But if your primary business is a pizza shop and now you're trying to be 17 other concepts, how well can you do all of them? So in the long run, the ones that will survive have to have something more than just we turned it on you know, Uber Eats or we turned it on DoorDash or we bought this concept. So how will the next five years look? And I think some of these platforms like Cookunity are really interesting because you'll see which chefs are going to survive, but they're in a platform that gives them a much better starting point because they have more control over it. And for certain chefs, that's that's the key. Once you lose control, I think the, you lose control of the brand as well. Yeah, great point because I think that the execution is everything in this, you know, in the situation. But it's not like I mean, I learned this. <laughs> believe me, I learned this the hard way. It's not like being in a restaurant. You know, these dishes have to be cooled down properly, and you follow the this, this, this very specific rules and, and how to do it right. And you need you need to follow them to the T. And and that's you know, and the execution is is so so important. And you know, we learn pretty quickly. Um, how to, you know, get these these dishes, um, you know, to, to the best quality possible when they arrive in someone's home. And it's, it's so funny, often, you know, in, the, in a restaurant, in, in a high pressure situation, you know, you've got four dishes and the fifth one is dragging and the fifth one comes up and it's like not the best, it's got to go, right? Um, in this scenario, you know, it's like, okay, hold on. This food is coming into someone's kitchen you're taking the time to lift off the, the, the packaging. It's got to be absolutely perfect every single time. Yeah, the, the, the point that Perry, the point that Perry was making is, is a very uh, important one because um, this, at the end of the day, is, a, is another marketplace, right? Where there's buyers and sellers. And the fundamentals, I think, are not too different from other food marketplaces like restaurants or, or restaurant delivery. Um, if food is great, like the reason John is one of the most successful chefs in the platform and, and grew from uh, being in New York to other four markets. And as far as I know, I think he has ambitious ambition to like continue growing. <laughs> is the food is great and he has adapted in understanding even things like naming is important in this new marketplace because people are making their choices based on a photo, the name of the dish, reviews from previous eaters, and the chef name. So obviously, if I know already trust John, I'm more likely to trust a new dish from John. But even things like what name do I put to a dish? It, it is important in a restaurant, but I will argue that probably less important than here because here they won't talk with a waiter or waitress, for example, to get an explanation, right? There will be a description. And things like that are important in terms of adapting, but the fundamentals of great food don't, cha don't change much. And, and, and I think um, that that will um, ex effectively translate to the same dynamics that any marketplace where chefs making great food will do great, chefs that care about their fans, chefs that are in the healthy dose, um, hear feedback, but in the, in, in the healthy ratio, like don't hear feedback and bring with their, their own ideas and perspective because people want to, to try new things. I think it's, it's, it's very, very um, uh, normal in that sense. Yeah, I think and, and that's interesting because I think that because, you know, I, I don't need, there's, there's not a, a whole lot of, um, you know, backend stuff that I have to worry about, right? I, I mean, the distribution's handled, the delivery's handled, so <laughs> I can actually spend time thinking about um, what to call something and, 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 and bounce it off my chef and bounce it off the guy, people and sort of, you know, take the time uh, to do the marketing, you know, which is so, so important in this, in this, um, in this space, you know, what to call a dish, you know, how it's, we've changed the names of dishes and, and, you know, to improve the sales all the time, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting because you don't have that waiter, you don't have that maitre d', you don't have that person to sell, you have the website and, you know, and the verbiage that you choose to use to name these dishes, you know, so that's a, I think it's a really good point, Mateo. And I was going to say to John's point, which is interesting, is that if you haven't experienced this restaurant, you don't have any awareness. Now, there is no front of the house. There is no initial kind of customer experience in that traditional sense. How can we digitally recreate that and extend what he's doing, his story, some of those pieces that can scale really well? And that's some of the things that we're trying to do at Eater Club is just about having a scalable reach because putting a chef in front of people is always going to be better than having a, a someone else trying to tell their story. So that could be their first encounter on Cook Unity. And maybe it's through a story and all of a sudden they're so excited by understanding how he started the first restaurant and this specific dish and how it connects back to his family. And that's pretty powerful, right? Now you, now you want to try it. Now it comes back to the quality of the food. 
But once you have that story and you meet it with the quality, those are moments that are created that are very similar to that restaurant experience that you can't duplicate. So it's it's much more scalable than just ordering off of a platform when you bring it all together, I think. So very excited for what they're doing. Yeah, and 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 the the comments, the, the section, or you know, the reviews are are invaluable because look, at, you know, listen, I don't, I don't know, there's a percentage of them that, that throw away, but you know, people like to complain, right? But um, the, the most of them really are. I mean, people take the time to to review and and tell you what's what they like and don't like. Um, it's really really helpful, and I really take 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 those to heart, and you know, try to answer. You know, people and, and you know, say like, oh, you know, this thing this sucked, and I'm sorry. You know, um, we'll we'll do better. You know, and we're all trying, always trying to do better. So the thing is, those, those are the reviews are very, very helpful. And that's in that case. And you know, along the the lines of the the customer experience, um, with so much going into you know off premise these days, we are, we're seeing so much packaging. We're seeing a lot of of sourcing in different ways. How do you kind of think about sustainable sourcing of your ingredients and packaging? I know sustainability is huge for you, Mateo, at Cook Unity, but how do you kind of all conceptualize that? Because everybody's probably thinking along the lines of, well, there's gonna be more packaging and whatnot um, through these different methods. Yeah, um, <clears throat> um, thank you, Julie, for pointing that out because it is important to us. Um, I, I, the way we try to approach this um, as much as possible is not thinking about what we're doing as a slightly different version of what already exists, but trying to think what will the food service, the modern food service, the food service that people need in 2023, 2025, 2030 should look like, right? And I think we cannot agree that one of the things that should be there is that it needs to be sustainable and needs to be very, very low um, impact um, for the planet and not only the planet, but for all the people in the value chain of food. I think food is something highly appreciated by everyone, of course, one of the most important cultural expressions that we have as humans. Um, not necessary to say how important food is for feeding ourselves and, and, and like um, keep it, keeping the energy, but it's one of the highest employers, it's very important in the economy, it's very important in society, but not always if we're like honest, not always those steps in the value chain are great or are fair or are like in, a, in what I would call like uh, optimal um, level, right? So um, obviously we want to uh, fix all those things ourselves. We cannot do that. We, we're not even like uh, pretending that we can do that, but it's, it's a very exciting exercise that we do together with the chefs to think, okay, what, how should we design this? And one of those answers is around some decisions that we can make about packaging, about sourcing of ingredients, right? We can decide to be all organic or whatever standard. That is a choice that we can make, but that obviously will increase prices to a point that we will leave outside 90% of the population. So that goes against the democratization of great food and great chefs. So like we need to find a balance there. One of the ways we are doing that is by segmenting some prices and so maybe some customers are okay and are willing to pay $4 more, $6 more for their organic produce or wild salmon. Um, but the good thing that we have by consolidating all these chefs and all these sales under the same roof, literally speaking, is that we obviously have a purchasing power um, that individual restaurants um, cannot access, right? So Kukiti just surpass a million meals a month that for restaurants will um, equal to, I don't know how many uh, dozens of 100 plus combined restaurants. So obviously that purchasing power that we translate directly to chefs and to customers allow us to, over time, keep prices very affordable, but improve, improve the standards of the um, ingredients that we source for chefs. And when chefs want to cook with even higher standards that will necessarily translate to an add-on, now we are introducing that so customers can, can choose. And the other piece is packaging. Um, where we, we develop it, we de develop a, a logistics program where 75 to 80% of our customers get a circular packaging solution where we can pick up most of the packaging used in the next delivery. So that's great for a lot of areas. Unfortunately, we cannot do that everywhere. So in very low density rural areas, we still ship in a bulky box via uh, mail. And we are very interested in finding solutions for that, but it's great that the majority of our customers have minimal packaging waste. 
So that combined with sourcing and combined with food waste, because when John team produce the meals every day in the kitchen, they know the day before how many portions of each one of their recipes they sold. Um, that's what the subscription nature and the weekly meal planning allows. So they're not overcooking. In a restaurant, it's very hard because even though you have mise en place, if you, if you think about it, it's a little bit of a crazy system, right? Like nobody knows exactly how many people are coming, what they're going to order. So they cook like one of these chicken and five minutes later, they need to do another one of the chicken. And, and, and it's not the most efficient system of all. It's the most inefficient system. <laughs> and I was gonna say really that for what we're doing with Eater Club is really trying to help take this back on the value chain, not just helping with sustainable packaging at the end, which is really important and even delivery and all these mechanisms, but how do you focus on sustainable emerging natural brands that need a helping hand? Because one of the things Mateo said, and I think obviously John knows from sourcing is that these are more premium products, right? So that would translate to a higher cost for the customer, which creates potential friction which means you never help bring the price point down, which means you never bring better food to more people. So part of our whole mission is to try to make better food more accessible, which means how do you actually put it in more hands, which is a first set of hands, get people excited so you can help bring the cost down to keep doing that. But it also starts with being ethically sourcing of cacao or thinking about how coffee is sourced, or even if something can be shipped in aluminum that's a lot more recyclable and you can reduce the carbon footprint, or where can you be local when you can be local, but that's not always the case, but trying to be conscious of all these different pieces collectively and also, I think something really interesting that Mateo said that we're trying to work on as well is that 70% of restaurant uh, food service facilities are independent operators of the million plus in the United States. Yet most of them are treated like the, the short end of the stick, let's just say. They get the hardest time in terms of ordering. They get the worst prices, lack of transparency, a million factors that work against them. Yet they're the majority of restaurants. So why is it the majority is actually being treated like they're the smallest player when in fact, collectively, they're the largest? So we're also trying to return that same pricing power, remove the salesperson from the legacy process so that we can, again, connect our brand just like a chef connects directly to the customer. We want to connect our brands directly to the chef. What do they need a middleman? Don't they want to learn about this great farm, wherever it might be, or this amazing new upcycled um, sustainable coffee or whatever, or product, whatever it is. And that's how you can make these more accessible because you need to be able to tell the story because the customer has to want to do it. If it's 50 cents more, or 20 cents more, you have to give them a reason. Otherwise, they're going to go to the next shop. And they're going to go to the next restaurant as much as they might like John or Cook Unity if they don't have these different options. But if you can tell them why and they, they, again, become compelled by these stories and they meet the people behind it, all of a sudden there's a reason, right? When you're supporting a small local kind of production, it's the same as supporting small chefs. So we want to carry that same thing forward, but you have to make it easy, right? You can't put the burden back on the chef or anyone sourcing. So we're just trying to do that heavy lifting so that we can have success with these kind of new great brands because everyone deserves to eat better overall. That's so true. And, you know, in my, you know, my restaurant in Hudson Valley is, is, I mean, it's as local as, as, you know, we, we've get, we've got, you know, the, the local lamb and, and, and local, uh, and local a great pork. Place to be. you know, and, and people, and, and the customer knows, the customer knows that it's, it's a premium product and they know it costs more. And, and there's an understanding that, you know, they're going to pay, you know, 30, $35 for an entree. And that's just, I mean, otherwise it, it just can't, can't be done. So I think there's, there's education happening on the consumer side that they know, look, if you're going to, you want an organic chicken, you want, you, you want no hormones, you want, there is a premium for that. And I think it's like today in the paper, you know, the, 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 the middle seats in the movie theater are now going to be more expensive than the front. And I mean, this is, this is yeah. the, the way this is all, all going, you know what I mean? It's the, the better thing costs more. And I, and I think everybody uh, has got to be okay with that. Karin, I really like and appreciate your point of view and the approach of Eater Club around this. Uh, the way we are trying to, to, to also highlight like small producers and, and small creators were first on the chef side <clears throat> and we're now introducing also other products like sauces or desserts and baked goods. Uh, on That's that side, sense. of course, Cookit is already a sharing platform. So by not necessarily employing, but sharing revenue, um, that's that's one way. But the other piece that is important to us is um, variety and offering many, many uh, different type of foods and type of meals that allow us, so New York, for example, our biggest market, we offer more than 500 different dishes every week. Obviously, uh, any single eater doesn't need that much variety, but what that allow us to do is that with the kind of, like, clear trend of people expecting more personalized food, customized to what their bodies needs and what their taste, et cetera, et cetera. It allows us to have 
closer and closer to the perfect menu every week to each type of customer. So we, we have a room, we have like a quota in our menu to work with up and comer brands. Um, and that includes like local, um, local farms in the New York area, but also that includes all the alternative protein movement, for example, right? When you have in a, in a traditional restaurant or in a traditional business, even if it is delivery also, usually when it is vertically integrated, you have much more restrictive nature here because you have a menu of eight to 12 items. So that kind of real estate there is very expensive. So putting new stuff there doesn't happen in a very dynamic fashion with having hundreds. And the reason why we couldn't do that is because it's a marketplace. So we're not training John's team to do another new trendy cuisine. John does what he loves to do and he recruits people that are proud of that type of culinary philosophy, but another chef is proud of some other trend emerging and is doing that. So by highlighting, people are passionate and talented about each one of these vertical is the way we can uh, showcase all that. Um, and just, you know, along uh, similar lines, you know, um, in terms of sourcing and thinking about, you know, we have host kitchens nowadays, in addition to uh, Cook Unity, just different ways that, that restaurants can use their, their kitchens to reach customers in multiple ways. How best can chefs and restaurants, you know, leverage what they already have with their ingredients on hand to do new things like join Cook Unity or, you know, do a virtual concept that's only through delivery? I mean, how does, does someone really think, you know, look at their kitchen and think I can turn this into something else, you, you know, it, along lines of sustainability and not having to, to source? you know, additional ingredients? Well, I think that you can, you can, you know, set up a, I mean, what we did um, in, in, at the Empire Diner, for example, is just, you know, we, we amended our dishes to, to sort of fit in, you know, into the, into the trays and, and, um, and, and test them and, and, and just sort of, and just start, <laughs> just, you know, just do it um, because it, it, it's, uh, it, means a lot, you know, to, to, to that, for that extra, you know, that extra uh, income source. So, um, you know, it takes a little bit of, of doing, but I mean, it's, it's certainly not, not rocket science. Yeah, I think an interesting exercise, uh, um, not maybe taking it like literal, but an interesting exercise is imagine John starting as a young chef in New York in today's world, right? Like before it was either working for a restaurant or raising some money, partnering with someone and opening a restaurant. I think the good news for everyone is that there are more options, right? And um, my, my suggestion to any chef would be to don't think this as this or that, but this and that, because most of these options are not exclusive and complementary because these are different channels tackling different customer needs. So Kugiti, is not taking away a business from Empire Diner or um, any of the restaurants in the city, really. Like oh, people are not deciding, are we going, are we going out tonight or getting community um, 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 at home? Like that's not um, how, how customers really think. So that's, that's a good news. And a lot of these channels are complementary. So it's better to think from the customer perspective. So what type of customers do I want to serve? Um, what type of price points and like, Cuisines do I want to serve? What type of geos do I want to serve? And then the sequence will differ. I have uh, many stories in Kukiti of chefs that own restaurants and use Kukiti to add uh, the use case of people eating at home and more geos. But I also have chefs in Kukiti that are all going to different regions where they wanted to open a restaurant and they're going to test and learn from Kukiti customers feedback first in LA or Texas or whatever, to then as a second step, once they feel confident enough that they understand what are the differences of the market, go into what is a much riskier and heavy lifting of opening a restaurant. So the sequence can vary depending on your access to capital, your name recognition and others, but this, this got much more interesting for everyone. Yeah. It's, it's all experience, sorry. Oh no, go on. I, I was just gonna say it's all ex, it's, it's experiential, and you know, to go out to the Empire Diner and have a hamburger is one experience, and to have the the community meal in the fridge and have my son pull open the plastic, and it's it's 
it's just a whole, you know, he gets so excited about it. It's just a whole different experience. Not better, not worse, just different. Yeah, and I think out here, especially in LA, the, the same concept is what you could start with a pop-up. You can try to get into a ghost kitchen. So there's not like a huge capital expenditure normally or where you really have to make these, you know, a multi-year lease commitment or whatever it is. You can have a small footprint. You can test something. You can spin up a concept. You could spin up two concepts in your virtual thing and, and test them at the same time, like an A-B test. So, I mean, it allows you to have so much flexibility but I think the trick comes back to what are you passionate about? What are you excited? What are you going to be able to do that's different? Because just having a fried chicken concept is really not, obviously in today's world where they're everywhere, it's not going to be enough. Even if it's good, it's hard because now you're competing against other good ones. How do you do something that on its face stands out? And again, comes back to that quality. So that's what I love about the platform that they're, everything is really about execution and quality and making sure that that's at the forefront. And then the chefs can be so tied to it that their brand is never, you know, some of these concepts are, you don't know who's behind the recipes, let's say. And maybe there's a reason for that. You know, it's a little bit more flexibility on how they're executed. You're not worrying about it, but can they survive? So I think in the long run, it's these connections. It's the things that help them stand out. And what's so interesting about what Cocunity is doing is, is obviously they have a certain set of customers that are already kind of geared towards these more premium at-home experiences. So now if you're a chef and you want to spin up there, you're already tapping into a customer base who's looking for that stuff. So it's very different than someone, let's say, pulling up Uber Eats it's a different type of customer. They're looking for a different type of meal. So each one is going to lock, want their own piece, but at the same time, there, there's room for everyone overall. But I think that we're going to see that the ones that have a true brand and a true kind of passion for it are the ones that are going to survive. Great. Um, we only have about less than 10 minutes uh, left. Um, so if anyone has, we have a couple of questions in the queue, but if you have any additional questions you'd like to ask, uh, now's the time. Um, um, so I will uh, shift to those questions because we have a couple of great ones. Um, this one's for Mateo. Um, how do you pick chefs to join Cook Unity and how does the back end work to make sure delivery matches up to the expectations for an in restaurant experience? So, hi, Monica. Thank you for the question. I will um, uh, answer in, in like two separate questions. So, the first one is. Um, First, if anyone listening is interested in what we're doing, please reach out. Um, we have a very friendly team and we're going to answer very fast and we'd love to meet in person if possible and try your food. But ideally we don't even pick. Ideally uh, we want to build cookies to be a very open platform and let just dynamics of buyers and sellers do their thing. Um, today, we, we have to have a, um, a selection process because we have more chefs uh, in the wait list than uh, customers joining. So even though we've been tripling in number of customers every year, um, for John to make economic economic sense to build a team, bring that team to our kitchen every day, they cannot sell 100 meals a week, right? They need to sell like a significant right. amount amount of meals. Um, and uh, our average chef is selling something around 3,000 meals and our top seller chefs are selling like 15, 20,000 meals a week. So, um, because these are real businesses built on top of our platform, and we have that nature in the way Cookity works today, we can onboard chefs as fast as we onboard the customers. And the second criteria is cuisines and type of foods that the, the specific region, we, we know based on service, uh, customers requests and others that they're looking for. So if we already have, we won't bring to, uh, Miami, who is a market, which is a market that we opened less than a year ago, uh, three chefs next week that cook similar food and John, because that will put like a necessary competition on, on, on John, and we're Very partners smart. with the chefs, and that will like over offer of that type of cuisine to customers when they really want more Indian, more this, more that. So uh, that that's kind of the criteria, and the third one is great food, um, which don't imagine any type of like TV show judging, uh, like again, customers will do that rating judging, but obviously anyone doing great food, famous or not famous, um, please, uh, we, we want to highlight that, that talent as much as we can. And just the fourth one is someone that is willing to engage with the community in the broader sense, the community of chefs, the community of customers, someone that kind of want to generate more income, but maybe don't care that much or is not willing that much to read the reviews like John was doing or help a fellow chef or like share some resources. I know that some, some cases of chefs that are sharing uh, some resources between them, like this is very much, I mean, it's in, in the name, right? Like Cookinity, but um, we, we do believe that the whole industry um, is a perfect 
type of place for more belonging, more community, more collaboration. And, and that's important for us. Those are the criteria that we, that we look for. And the second question, um, the short answer of that second question is, uh, it's 100% on cookie once the chef handle the fully cooked, fully cooled down and plated uh, food in the, in the delivery tray to handle fulfillment and logistics. And uh, as I said, 80% of our customers receive the meals, deliver more like white glove service with a local courier. And normally it's the same person coming to your house every week uh, and they will grab the reusable bag and the reusable ice pack and the reusable, uh, almost everything every week. So yeah, we track very rigorously um, the customer satisfaction on that step of delivery, um, fulfillment, sealing, um, cold chain, all that is on Google. Um, and John, I have a question for you. Um, since your food can be consumed anytime up to six days after cooking, how do you imagine what can go wrong in this food between time of preparation to time of consumption? And how do you train, control your chefs all over? Yeah, well, we're, we're, that's a lot can go wrong, which is why we are the sticklers for um, everyone having um, food handlers license, everyone having thermometers and everyone understanding how um, the, the what the protocol is for these for, for the way we, we plate um it's just so important to, to do things in a proper way and um we train for you know we we train everyone for for a week um and and make sure we go over all the proper temperatures make sure that people know you know what about danger zone about cooking things and cooling it down everything is cool everything is cool before plating um and then we plate in a in a refrigerated room so we just mitigate any sort of um, possibility of, um, you know, something going wrong. I have a question for John, actually. Go ahead. I'm curious, like, as a perfectionist in terms of what you're executing with the recipes, have you come across a couple recipes or items that didn't translate for delivery and you had to take them off? Oh, or, absolutely. <laughs> and obviously there's probably some favorites you have. That's what I was trying to think. Like, it must be so yes. hard when you want that item to make it and you do everything yeah. you can. And so then I can no. tell you, I've been, I've been making Roman artichokes okay. for, for my whole career. And they're just the, you know, they're just the crispiest, most delicious thing. They just don't hold up and they're just a complete disappointment, you know, and you know, we, <laughs> I've made them, I've put them in the thing. I've had them sealed, brought them home. Ah, no, can't do it. So it's just, it, yes, so you're, uh, resolute yes on that. That's sad, those sound good. Yeah. <laughs> but many do, but many, many more, you know, work out just fine. Yeah, how do you determine that, or how do you figure out that it, it is deliverable, that, that you can execute? Like, how do you test and figure out that it's- Yeah, so we can- we can go and have have it sealed and, and and put it into the fridge overnight and then and then you know we we can, I can like a lot of my a lot of my dishes are I know a lot of people love to microwave the food but I just like a lot of my instructions are please don't microwave this you know put it in the oven or, or and I have a cacio e pepe dish um, which I which I really ask people to, to do it on the stove look if you need absolutely need to you know to to use the microwave I have the instructions for that but there's a we want to make this a great experience and have it be the best possible food. So we, you know, we tested and I, and I, you know, for the kacha pepper, I put it in the microwave, we, put it, we did it in the oven and we did it on the stovetop. The stovetop is just way better. So that's, and so that's what we recommend. We test, I mean, we try yeah. to. I, I think this has been a, a topic for us since we started this, both for chefs and eaters. I think the, it would be best to don't compare this with a restaurant delivery where the food is made a la minute and delivered in 30 minutes, one hour, one hour, 50 minutes, whatever, but hopefully arrives warm and everything is designed that way. This is more like hiring a private chef that comes to your house, cooking batches and leave meals in the fridge for the whole week. So it's expected that there will be a step of heating up and um, a lot of chefs say like, this is the fast way of doing it. So you can use a microwave, but a lot of chefs, as John said, said, please take two, three extra minutes and follow these steps. Squeeze the lime, lemon there, or like use a skillet for that. But I think it's closer to meal planning with a private chef than 
uh, getting the liver um, from a restaurant in the moment. Good point, Great. yeah. Uh, yeah, we are just about out of time and we have like a minute left. <laughs> um, but this was a really great discussion. I, I certainly learned a lot uh, about the process. Um, and thank you all so much. It was really great uh, talking with you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Glad to be here. Darren, John, Julie, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.